Now, breaking into the video game business has always been very difficult. Today, you need a multi-zillion dollar budget and a big team to make a game. Back in the day, you needed access to really high-end obscure equipment because people didn't have high-powered computers in their houses back then. It was really hard just to be a guy with a soldering iron and a dream. Despite the fact that we now live in an age in which it's really cheap to get your own tools to create media and then actually have free tools to blast it out to anyone, there once was a time in which Power to do that kind of thing was expensive, and only a few people had access to it. So back in 1981, a couple of MIT students named Doug McRae and Kevin Curran started a company called, anonymously enough, General Computer. Now these are guys who loved video games. They had a couple of arcade machines, they loved playing them, they loved playing around with them, they actually went out and leased games and put them around campus so they could collect the quarters. They loved gaming, but they were just engineering students. They had no way to really break into the game's business. See, there are two MIT students who basically said, you know what? We love games so much we want to get into the business, but they didn't have the money like, you know, Atari or some other big company to make the games. So what did they do? They found their own way in. They'd been observing for a while that people were starting to tire of Missile Command. They just weren't as interested in it. So they had this kind of thought, huh, what if we modify the games, change them around a little bit, increase the challenge, maybe rebrand it, and see what happens. So their theory was that if you had a game sitting around in your arcade and people were kind of getting bored with it, they'd already mastered it, well, they wouldn't come back and play it anymore. But if you could take the game and kind of remix it, add something to it, then the kids would come back, they'd start pumping quarters into that machine, and you didn't have to buy a whole new cabinet or a company didn't have to develop a whole new game from scratch. And these are just two guys. They don't have millions of dollars. They don't have industry contacts. They just love games. They're creative, and they have the knowledge to take them apart and put them back together again. They didn't have the resources to make an actual game. They can't construct a cabinet, much less all the circuitry that needs to go inside of it. All they could do is modify an existing game. Since video games were actually pretty simple back then, programming-wise, they were able to kind of reverse engineer the code on the game, actually open up a cabinet, make their own circuit board, attach it to the circuit board already in the game, and then modify the game like that. Basically, the way these enhancement boards work is they just lay in some new code on top of the existing code, plug it into the board of the coin op game, and boom! You basically have a whole new game. So Doug and Kevin figured that they would make these enhancement boards for games. And basically people who are bored could come back and try something new. And people that had mastered the game, well, they have something else to master. They probably envy people that modify games nowadays. The companies support them. They encourage this and put out the tools. These guys are literally looking at the circuit board and soldering extra stuff onto it. They basically made a sequel to Missile Command by adding an enhancement board, and they called it Super Missile Attack. Same type of gameplay, you know, Missile Command, you know, you're basically shooting things that are coming down at you, trying to defend the land, but what they did in Super Missile Attack was they added UFOs, they added more jets, they sped the game up, added new colors, bam, instantly, you know, that's a new game. You can see their direct descendants today are the people modding games like Half-Life and Unreal Tournament. Uh, just some guy in his garage made Counter-Strike, and Counter-Strike made Half-Life. Half-Life was a popular game, but it was Counter-Strike that really ensured its longevity, and its place as one of the greatest games of all time. The guy who created Counter-Strike doesn't have the resources to build a video game engine, uh, and an online component of that. He took what was already there and remixed it and added it to make something completely new. They don't know how to break into the video game world, so they just do it on their own because they have a love of it and they have a knowledge that you know most people don't have. And nowadays, game companies like Valve give them the tools to do that because they see the value it adds. This user-made content, which can be as simple as just remixing what's already there or creating something completely new, adds so much value for almost no investment to these companies. And it all starts with General Computer. So they tried this experiment experiment out with a couple of Missile Command machines on campus, and it actually worked pretty well. And they thought, hey, let's turn this into a business. People really liked the new game. It felt fresh. It was just more challenging. They got people back into it. All right, so this began the direction for their, their little company called General Computer. So the guys started making these add-on boards. They took out an ad in some video game industry trade publication selling these things for $300 a pop. And this is a heck of a summer job for a few kids in college looking for a secondary income. These boards only cost $30, and they're selling them pretty successfully in the back of magazines for $300. If they had done it 30 years later and were able to sell things over the internet instead of the back of magazines, they probably could have sold a million of them. So they sell 1,000 of these enhancement boards at $300 a pop. Now that's pretty good money back in 1981. You know, a thousand boards, $300 a pop, that's $300,000. These guys are instantly in business. I mean, what was basically a lark turned into a really, you know, decently profitable small business for them. So the guys then, once they had the success with their Missile Command mod, 
they set their you know sights on something much bigger. So they realize if there's a market for Missile Command remixes, imagine what the market would be for the biggest video game of all time, Pac-Man. You know, there's a lot more Pac-Man machines than there are Missile Command machines. In fact, there's 100,000 Pac-Man machines. If each one of those had a $300 enhancement board that cost them $30 to make, they just made $27 million in 1981. $27 million in 1981 for a couple of MIT students? There's nothing in the world they couldn't do at that point. Now, this game wasn't as easy as Missile Command. It was a little, it was a bit more sophisticated. A lot more work had to go into actually modifying it. So they were hard at work. They were making some progress. And uh, when you look back at it now, it's sort of like a duh moment, but uh, Atari sued them. Right when they finished the enhancement board for Pac-Man, of course, Atari comes in with a lawsuit suing them about copyright infringement on Missile Command. Now, it's not that Atari uh, was that concerned about the intellectual property of Missile Command. Uh, they kind of were, but not really. Their real concern was if arcade owners could get a whole new game experience out of their game for just $300 paid to some kid somewhere, well, then they weren't spending the thousands of dollars with Atari that it would cost to get a whole new game brought into their establishment. Atari's whole business model is selling new games, and if these kids are just selling cheap upgrades to the old ones, Atari's going to go out of business so they have no choice but to go after them. You know, they file temporary injunctions which basically tells General Computer, stop what you're doing, you're not allowed to make anything else until we sort this out in court. Well, on the surface of it, you might think, yeah, these guys totally had no right to modify these guys' games and sell that. Actually, the courts disagreed. It was a little bit more complicated than you'd think. Because Atari is under the impression that these guys took their code, reworked it, and then sold it for their own purposes. But technically, it didn't really mess with Atari's code at all. It just laid new code on top of it. So copyright infringement really didn't apply here. Atari goes into court thinking, this is an open and shut case. These guys stole our stuff and made money off of it. But that's not really what happened. Nowadays, we have a lot of laws about how code is copyrighted and what you can do with it. Uh, but back then, it was still something new, so it was very complicated legally and no one was really sure how it was going to shake out. The, the case threatened to kind of go on for a while and cost Atari a bit of money, um, with the potential that they might actually end up losing it. And Atari obviously doesn't want to risk that it goes against them, because then everyone would start making these things. During the court proceedings, one of the Atari lawyers pulls the kids aside and basically asks them, what do you guys want out of this? And the kids are like, we just want to make games. So. Atari's, you know, counter to that is, well, why don't we just hire you to make games? And that's what they did. So Atari says, all right, we're going to give you 50 grand a month for like two years. It'll be a nice fat contract. You go out and make some games. Just stay out of our hair and stop selling these damn boards. It's like kind of if you, if you make your own indie film and then Spielberg sees and he's like, gives you a lot of money to make a real movie. That's sort of what happened here. It, it has a happy ending in that Atari realized what talent they were and decided to use that instead of fight it. The only problem was, they just finished the Pac-Man enhancement board. And they put a lot of work into this board because it was difficult to do. So they don't want to lose all this work that they did. Now, the deal with Atari said that they couldn't sell any boards unless they got the permission of the publisher of the game. Now, Atari wasn't getting given permission, but they said, you know what? Midway makes Pac-Man. Maybe we can go talk to them and see if we can just put out this last board anyway just because we worked so hard on it. Their thought was basically, you know what? Before they start to figure out what really happened with Atari, let's see if we can bluff them you know, into getting their permission, letting us. They, they figured the answer was gonna be no, but they were making all this money from Atari. Anyway, they could afford the flight down there. They wanted to just make it work. So the two guys, well, they fly up to Chicago to meet with Midway, and they figure, you know what, we're gonna bluff them a little bit. They go in there and said, listen, we're in car with Atari, but we've basically beaten them. They folded, and we've got this Pac-Man mod. We're gonna start selling it anyway, but I'll tell you what, we wanna be nice. If you give us your permission to do it, well, then we'll work with you on it. These kids are expecting Midway to be furious. They expect, you know, when they walk into this meeting for Midway to be like, there's no way we're allowing you to do this. A hundred lawyers are gonna attack and make sure this never sees the light of day. But in reality, Midway was like, thank God you guys are here. We have nothing else. Basically, Pac-Man was the surprise hit. You know, they had no idea it was going to become what it was. So Midway basically had thrown all of its resources against Pac-Man, leaving no time to develop the follow-up and figure out what it was going to be. So anytime you've got a hit, you got to follow it up with a hit. So Midway had one of the best-selling games in the world, Pac-Man, but they didn't have anything to follow it up with. And so these two young guys came in with new ideas. So they're like, wow, we have something else. This is great. We didn't have to do anything for it. You guys already did it. We have nothing because all of our money and time has been spent 
with Pac-Man. So these kids are pretty much come in and they save the day. So Midway takes a look at what these guys have made. Uh, it's basically an add-on that turns Pac-Man into a game called Crazy Auto. It's like an improved version of Pac-Man. He's got legs, he's running around, but the mazes are better. Just a much cooler game. Well, Midway says, all right, Crazy Auto, whatever. Instead of doing Crazy Auto, Midway was like, look, let's just keep it in the Pac-Man world and do a sequel to Pac-Man. And, you know, collectively, they sort of looked at Pac-Man. They said, you know, it's been a big hit with women. What if we made Miss Pac-Man? So was Birth the what would become the number one arcade game of all time. Now the changes weren't just cosmetic. Miss Pac-Man was actually a much better game. It had four different mazes. The ghosts actually had some kind of rudimentary AI. They didn't just follow a pattern. It was just a better game in every respect. You know, when they originally were coming out with the game, it was going to be called Pac-Woman. Some folks within the company, I think, took issue with it. You know, it had some sexist implications. So they were like, all right, we'll call it uh, Miss Pac-Man which then freaked everyone out because in the story, you actually had a baby Pac-Man. So I guess people were a little nervous that, you know, with Ms. Pac-Man, it'd be illegitimate. You'd have a Pac bastard and then we'd all be in for a, a world of pain. Then they're like, all right, let's call it Mrs. Pac-Man. But again, we're in the era in which Ms. Magazine was coming out. You know, feminism was evolving as a movement. All right, so Mrs. Pac-Man was a little too patriarchal. So everybody decided, you know, Ms. Pac-Man, it's just right. They agreed upon it. Yeah, the crazy thing is this whole flap about about what we should we call Ms. Pac-Man took place four days before the arcade machines were going into production. So it was Pac-Woman up until four days before they started producing the game. Technically, there were no Ms. Pac-Man machines. There were Pac-Man machines with an enhancement board plugged in, some stickers slapped on the side, and ta-da, Ms. Pac-Man. So it's so funny, you know, when you think about it, Ms. Pac-Man, you really feel like, oh, that that's Pac-Man 2. But in reality, you might actually just call Ms. Pac-Man, Pac-Man version 1.5. Ms. Pac-Man went on to become the number one game of all time, selling 115,000 units and saving Midway a ton of money in the process. A lot of people assume that Ms. Pac-Man, one of the biggest, most successful games of all time, a cultural icon was made by uh, millions of dollars at some company, but it was just two guys in their dorm room. Uh, well, they were, they were probably in their dorm room, but wherever they were, it was almost certainly dark, and Miss Pac-Man was almost definitely the only woman in the room. And they made it. It was like weird science. Miss Pac-Man was a huge hit for both Midway and General Computer, which led to Baby Pac-Man, and then Pac-Man Jr. Now, this is where the problems start, because Midway went ahead and made Baby Pac-Man without the General Computer guys. And General Computer was like, hold on a second. We're responsible for the whole Pac-Man family. So any of the money that you're making from these games, we should have a cut of that. So Doug and Kevin sue Midway saying the whole idea for a Pac family was ours. And even though Baby Pac and all the other Pac-Man games aren't a hit, they get in on that sweet Pac-Man merchandising. And at this point there's a Pac-Man cartoon and both the wife and the baby are on the cartoon. There are lunch boxes, etc. You know, so these guys got a piece of all of that merchandising, which is really where the money was at that point because Baby Pac-Man was just kind of a flop. So while all this is going on, they're actually working on an original game for Atari. Remember them? Atari was paying them to make games. Well, they finished their game. It was called Food Fight. They basically, you know, throw food around and have a fight with it. They call up Atari and say, hey, our first game is ready. You want to come pick it up? And Atari says, who the hell are you guys? Oh, wait, you're the guys we're paying 50 grand a month to, uh, to go away. We didn't know you were actually going to make any games. I mean, in essence, the $50,000 a month that Atari was paying in general computer is nothing more than hush money. I mean, they never expected these guys to make games. They just wanted to shut them up. They bought them out so that they could put them on the shelf. The game they made was called Food Fight. It basically consisted of a little boy on one side of the screen and a big honking ice cream cone on the other side of the screen. And his goal was to get past all these angry chefs in the middle throwing food at each other to eat the ice cream. Atari didn't exactly expect them to make a game, but when they found out they made it, they were like, yeah, sure, bring it in. And it turns out it's pretty decent and they published it. Now the crazy thing about Food Fight was, even though it wasn't the best game ever, they made it in like 90 days. It was a completely ridiculous span of time to make a game in. Atari sees this and says, hey, you know what? These guys are actually pretty good at this whole making a game business. We gotta get them doing something that's actually gonna make us some money. And so they actually put them to work porting games from the arcades to home consoles. And at the time, most of the Atari ports sucked. I mean, you look at Pac-Man for the 2600 is a perfect example. So they put the guys to work making the Atari 2600 ports of all the classic arcade games. Stuff like Pole Position, Centipede, Dig Dug, Joust, Moon Patrol, Crystal Castles, and of course, fittingly, the 2600 version of their own game, Ms. Pac-Man. Even Mario Brothers. I mean, they were the ones responsible for it. 
you know, they did their own game, Miss Pac-Man, which was such a better translation than Atari's version of Pac-Man on the 2600. So these kids are so good, they end up making all these great ports for the 2600, they end up making half the games for the 5200, and they end up designing the 7800 itself. You know, they go on to make the chip for the 7800, which would have been a great system in 1984, but it was shelved for three years, and that is another episode. <laughs> in the end, after a few years of doing this, um, you know, Doug McCray and Kevin Coran pretty much got out of the video gaming business. They went on to, to do some work for Mac, and, and, and they actually pioneered some laser printing technology. Now after Food Fight, they did make one other arcade game. It was called Quantum in 1982. Actually a tremendous failure of flop, but you know, every great career has got to have one uh, big misstep in it, and that was theirs. They have one bomb, Quantum. But to offset that, they also have the number one game of all time in Miss Pac-Man. They went on to pretty much make Atari the name that it is now. I mean, that's not too bad for two college kids out of MIT who had no money to start with, had no ties to the video game industry, and just loved video games. At least spiritually, the, you know, the fact that Doug McRae and Kevin Coran got in there as fans, made their own mods, actually ended up being bought out by not just one, but two major game makers, basically laid the groundwork for aspiring modders that, you know, carries over into today.